having not been around church for the past four weeks, to come back and to sit in a service where you can okay. just open your heart and sing. There's so much joy involved in that for me. It's just such a it's such a privilege that we have as believers that God has given us this ability to communicate and to speak with Him and to sing to Him. And um, lots of cultures may not get this or understand this, but singing has been around since the dawn of time. It's just been one of the most beautiful ways that I find to communicate with the King of Kings and that He communicates back with me. It's so beautiful and I just want to say thank you for the, the team. It's such a privilege to come into a, a place and, and to have this quality of just music and, and hearts. You can hear and see the hearts. So good. Anyways, I want to welcome you to church. Uh, we've got a bunch of things on church news, so just we're just going to power down these and uh, then we're going to move into a time of the Word. So today is uh, Cafe Church, so there's lunch on after church, so come on downstairs. Uh, we're going to get, head on down there straight away uh, and get involved with some lunch. It smells great already. I'm looking forward to it. Looking forward to catching up with a, a bunch of people around the table as well. If you haven't come prepared or you're just surprised the fact that it's Cafe Church, don't worry about that. Come on down and I'm sure there'll be food. Uh, I want to welcome everyone who's visiting church today. It's great to have you. We've got, got a bunch of people over here. Welcome. Um, coming up we have our women's retreat that's happening on the 26th to the 28th of October. And numbers are filling up quickly. There's only, uh, I think, four or five spaces left on that. And so if you want to get in, now is the time to do it. It's going to be a great weekend away. Uh, we're looking for volunteers to get involved with stuff. And so as people are volunteering their time, and we've got people to do the camera, which uh, Naomi's not here today. And so as you can tell, um, the invisible person sitting on that couch now on the chair is going to do the, the filming for us. Uh, so we're looking for people to get involved with scripture teaching, doing flowers here, baristering downstairs, morning teas and welcoming. doesn't take much, and if we all do a little bit, we can all get stuff done. I want to thank Claudio and Andrew for doing all the, the lawns and the grounds yesterday. It looks great outside. Um, we're also asking, uh, and this happens once a year for us, we look to buy Bibles for all the kids at school scripture. And so if you feel like you'd like to donate to that, uh, you need to see Mila or Ida. I don't think Mila is here. Can't see Mila in the room. Um, or just give, give it to Ida. So if it, and it can be anything from a dollar to a hundred, doesn't matter. Um, but if you want to give it, it's putting Bibles in the hands of all the school kids that we're teaching uh, Scripture to. Next Sunday, we've got daylight savings, so we're going to lose now. Yes. So you've got to come to church an hour early next next Sunday. Um, so don't forget, you know, I'm sure all of our phones sort of update that automatically these days. It's so good having your phone do that these days and not forget that. Does anyone remember that stress of waking up and going, what time is it and have I missed daylight savings and realising you have? Yep. So daylight savings next Sunday. Uh, and also Thursday night Bible study. We're on holidays at the moment, so we won't be meeting this week. I'd like you to welcome someone to church that you didn't come to church with. So take a minute just to walk around and say hi to somebody in church that you didn't come to church with. Excellent. 
So we're going to spend a little bit of time in prayer and just want to encourage you just to um, pray with me. One of the things that God has really convicted my spirit about while I've been away on holidays or while Trish and I have been away is my faith is uh, expressed through my prayers. And so how big your prayers are will show something of how big your faith is. Uh, and so I just want to encourage you to express your prayer and faith maybe bigger than you ever have before. So you might be praying that God gives you the needs for this very day, as, uh, as the Lord's Prayer is saying, but that's cool. But I'm wondering whether we could pray that for somebody else. We're also very conscious of Sulawesi at the moment in Indonesia with that awful earthquake that's hit it and that enormous tidal wave that's gone through a town. Uh, they're saying that 420 people have died, but they're expecting that, that amount to go way north of that when they get out into the outlying regions. Uh, if you've seen any of that on the TV, it's just horrific to see what that what that um, tidal wave or tsunami has done. So I want to pray for that area too. And I want to pray that God will just be impacting lives there and changing lives there even at this very moment. Uh, we, we, we see disasters and we go, where's God gone? But He's there. He's very much there. And we're going to start praying miracles now. Does that make sense? And so that, that there will be some level of love that just impacts the, the island of Sulawesi that is just maybe not been seen or known before. I'm very conscious that in, even in our own country, there are things that we need to be praying for. Who's been praying for Nauru and the, the families and the kids on Nauru? Uh, it's funny being in New Zealand where they have this heart's desire to welcome all those people from Nauru there. They want to do it. They've tried every way possible for that to happen and the Australian government still says no. They've got places, they've got uh, families to settle people in, they've got it all. Uh, but and still, we, we live in a country that closes its borders when we see such a need. And I, I just wonder whether our faith today can express ourselves in such a way that we want to see some change uh, that impacts maybe some of the law keepers of our, our, our land that it can allow uh, for us to meet some needs of people that are very, very high. And so as you can tell, there's lots of areas of our lives where we can go safe with our prayers and small with our prayers, or we can actually believe in the God who just moves things and changes things and, and redeems things and restores things. And, and just in asking Him to invade those places, I just know that the Lord just listens to the prayers of His people. And, and great prayers, which can just be as simple as, Lord, can you impact this community in, in ways that I've never seen before? That's a, that's a great prayer. It's not linguistically perfect, but it's a great prayer. And so I just want you to join with me in prayer. And so, and so Father, you are our Heavenly Father. And how brilliant is your name. We sing songs, Lord, that declare the things of heaven to be the things of earth. The things that are occurring in heaven, we have Christ himself who says, I do nothing without first going to the Father and I'm doing what the Father is doing. And so, Father, it is in that place that we want to stand in Christ's very footsteps and say, whatever it is in heaven that you're doing right now, that is what we want to do on this earth. We want to bring love uh, to this planet in a way that, as we have sung, it just floods fear. And drives fear away. And I'm just so conscious, Lord, on the island of Sulawesi, Lord. Right now, uh, there is so much grief and fear and trauma. Uh, and I just want to pray, Father, that you'll be uh, in, uh, raising up and, and, and infiltrating that land of, of, with love. In ways that we can't comprehend, but Lord, that you surely can. And so, Father, we want to pray that you'll be pulling back floodwaters. And I pray, Father, that there will be stories of restoration and redemption that flow through communities of people. And, Lord, I just want to pray that you comfort those that have lost uh, this very day. I think of, of, of places like Nauru, and, Lord, my heart just cries out uh, for those who are in so much need. And, and, yes, Lord, I don't know all of their stories, but I do know, Lord, that we can love. And I just want to pray, Lord, that today that our love will stretch further than it has ever stretched before. And that we will see changes and we will see restoration and redemption and places will come available. And, and Lord, that if there's laws that are preventing this from happening, Lord, I pray that you be breaking down those places and so that freedom can come. Lord, that we will be known as a land that loves. 
And Father, I want to pray for it. just a great move of your Holy Spirit through the country of Australia. It's a beautiful land. It's, it's a wonderful land. But Lord, today, I want to pray that in this, this church here in Haverfield, uh, that, Lord, that today, that as the prayers of your people are raised up, that your heart will be turned, and Lord, that uh, life will be brought, and that we will see, uh, Lord, in our own time, in this very place, uh, lives changed and transformed as well. And so, Lord, I pray now for the preaching of the gospel. Lord, let it be in accordance with what you will for it to be today, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've got your Bible, I want you to open up to Psalm 78. Trish and I have had a wonderful uh, four weeks away, and for, for some of you guys, I said it's gone so fast. And yeah, it's been fast for us too, but it's just been a wonderful uh, four weeks, and I thank you guys, and we thank you guys for your prayers for us and allowing us into that time to be able to just relax. Trish in my version of relaxing is climbing mountains, uh, doing bushwalks, skiing, uh, all kinds of things, and that might not be your version of relaxing, but it's definitely ours. And so we've come back uh, a whole bunch fitter than we left, um, and some of our muscles are a little bit sore than we left, but we're so blessed that the Lord has just given us this time. And um, one of the things I want to share with you today is one of the things that I felt the Lord laid on my heart while we're away. And Psalm 78 is where it starts, and Psalm 78 is, um, they call it a son, son of Asaph, it's a man who lived many, many um, millennia ago, but it says, O oh, my people, listen to my instructions and open your ears to what I am saying. I love that phrase, open your ears to what I am saying. We're not actually asking God to do that for us, we're saying to God, I'm going to open my ears because I want to hear you speak. Okay? And we just sang a song about being hungry and thirsty and desperate for God. And, and God's like, yeah, I'm here. And, and he is asking us, are our ears open to hear today? He says, for I will speak to you in a parable. I will teach you hidden lessons from our past, stories we have heard and known, stories of our ancestors that have handed down to us. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. I will teach you hidden lessons from our past. That phrase stopped me as I was reading it. Uh, because it then goes on to talk about all the stories that have been passed on that Asaph has known. And I'm going to speak this morning about a story that Asaph would have known. But I'm going to start with a story uh, that I know and a story of what Trish and I have just been into in the last uh, few weeks. But it starts 35 years ago. 35 years ago, uh, I learned how to ski, and it's the last time I skied. I was 14 years old when I finished skiing. That was my whole career. I did it for three weeks. Uh, a week when I was uh, 12, a week when I was 13, and a week when I was 14. And um, when you're 12, 13, and 14, if you fall over, you bounce. When you're 49, you don't. And not having skied in 35 years, I was just, I was. To be perfectly honest, I was quite nervous about doing it when I went to New Zealand. Uh, Trish and I, when we last went, or actually three years ago we went, and, and it was snow season then, but we didn't have the courage or the money to do it in that place. But, and we decided that we would come back and we would ski at some point. And, and so this was the time. And so months and months ago, we bought a four-day pass uh, to ski at the Remarkables in Queenstown. Now, months and months ago, that's, that's, that's a long way away from a holiday. You go, I've got a lot of time to get ready for that. But as you guys know, six months seems to disappear so quickly. And all of a sudden, you're standing there in Queenstown and you're going, I'm not sure I really want to ski. We'd already paid for four days. We'd already got our, our skis and our boots hired and everything, so that was all done. It wasn't money that was holding me back. It was actually fear. Fear that I couldn't do it again and fear that I would probably be injured. Uh, fear that we, we would uh, just have wasted a whole bunch of money on, on this. And, and, and so Patricia and I, this was a really interesting time. And so we got to Queenstown and, the, and I think about three days after we get into Queenstown, they had this enormous dump of snow. And that everyone's saying this is the best ever. And uh, Trish and I were only in Queenstown initially for a few days, and, and we decided that we weren't going to ski in those few days. 
And, and so we said we're not going to ski. And the locals were saying to us, we're crazy because this is the best. It's not going to get any better than this. It's not going to snow like this again. And Trish and I go, no, oh, that's okay. We, we will ski later. We will but we'll do it. It was kind of putting off the inevitable. But fear prevents you from stepping into places that you know that you might be able to step into. And so we, we, we came and gone from that and we, we missed that opportunity and then we started travelling around a bit of the South Island and we ended up in Tekapo and while we were there, there was one ski field that was near where we were and we decided that we would just try it. Just, just to try it, to see how it was going to go and, and I put these skis back on my feet and, and before you know it I was 14 years, 14 years old and I was skiing down a mountain and I was just having the time of my life and I'm saying why was I worried when it was all happening. I had a funny moment that first day because the, the, first, the first ski run down, it was a very long run, it was about a kilometre, and my legs were killing me, absolutely killing me. And I think, I cannot do this for five days. I just cannot do it. It's just so painful. And I was just going, when is this run going to end? Because it's so painful. And so I decided to start going quite quickly down this particular track. And I'm, I've got my eyes fixed on the prize, and I'm looking towards the end, and I'm thinking I'm going really, really fast. And this little kid at five years old skis up beside me. He says, how's it going? Mate. <laughs> doing good, how are you doing? Great. He's five years old and he's skiing past me. When we got to Queenstown, God just uh, allowed us into this beautiful little moment. The day after we got there, it snowed uh, at 55 centimetres in one day right down to the water so we had this fairy tale of a moment and Trish and I started skiing. I skied for three days and I hadn't fallen and then the inevitable happened. I fell in the most ridiculous place in the most embarrassing moment. I fell. It wasn't hurtling down a mountain, it wasn't going through moguls, it wasn't any of that, it was getting through the gates of the chairlift and then I fell. And here's this clumsy old over trying to get up, so embarrassed. I got all the way up to the top and I, I started skiing down and you can feel yourself being embarrassed and I decided to take a new path, it turns out that was a really difficult path and I got into it and I got into a whole bunch of trouble. I eventually got down to it, but it was the most embarrassing concept of skiing that has ever been happened. I'm sure it was just so difficult. And I got to the bottom, I'm thinking, I just want to go home right now. And this little voice had said to me, do not let defeat be the last thing you do today. And so I sucked it up and got back on the chairlift and went up and had the run of my life. But again, you can hear that fear will stop what God has actually planned and intended. And so often, with the stories from the past, it's, it's, it's this concept of what God is doing is so rich and so powerful and, and so amazing. We speak about grace and we declare God's love over us and, and all of that kind of stuff. But all of a sudden, when we start thinking about fear, the whole concepts of grace get smaller and we start concentrating more on our defeats than we do in our victories. The next day we were skiing and this lady in front of me at this chairlift fell over. She couldn't get up. She was with her husband and her husband refused to help her. And I didn't know what to do at that point in time and she's so embarrassed and she turns around to me and she's so embarrassed and she, just, and she says, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I said, I was there yesterday. I know exactly how you feel. Take your time. I've got all the time in the world. Right back in the Old Testament is the story of Jacob, and the story of Jacob has meant a whole bunch to me over the years. One, I named my own son after after Jacob. Now, the word Jacob in the Bible is not why we named Jake Jake. Uh, the word Jacob in the Bible, what it means is to, to supplant or to steal. And that's not why we call Jacob <laughs> Jake. We call him Jake because we love the name, it was strong. 
But the story of Jacob has meant a whole bunch to me over these last few weeks, and I want to just share with you some of the hidden secrets of the past, and so that you'll see how these hidden secrets of the past are actually lessons for the present, so that we can be starting to live our lives in places of faith rather than places of fear. Are you up for that? Jacob was a man who stole. Now you only get that name because you steal. He came out of the womb and he was trying to hold on to his brother. He's trying to pull his brother back so he'd come out first. I don't know sure how that happened. I've watched the baby being born and I'm not even sure how that happened, but apparently it did. And there is Jacob trying to pull his brother back, and that's Esau. And we know the story of Jacob and Esau, where, where Jacob stole Esau's birthright. Now that doesn't mean a whole bunch to us in the 21st century, but it means a whole lot to people in that century. Because what Jacob received could not be given away. And when Jacob stole the brother's birthright, Jacob's life changed. He wanted the brother's birthright so he could have the father's inheritance and blessing, but what he got was his brother's scorn and hatred. Because he stole what needed to be given. Jacob's life was on the run and, he, and Esau was trying to find him to kill him, but Jacob ran to his, his uncle Laban. Now, knowing that you have a name by what you're known for, can you imagine walking up to your uncle and say, hey, I'm the supplanter? And your uncle just says, awesome, come on in. I don't know if that actually happened. But names mean stuff in the Old Testament. We get that. We fully understand that. But here is Jacob and he goes to Laban and, and, and he falls in love with Laban's second daughter, Rachel. And Laban then deceives Jacob. It's funny how the deceiver doesn't like to be deceived. Now, because he was supposed to marry Rachel, but, but Laban didn't want him to marry Rachel. He wanted to marry Leah. And, and so he tricked Jacob into marrying Leah. Still not 100% sure how that actually really happened. Uh, but at the concept, at the end of the day, Jacob had two wives. He had Leah first and then Rachel second. The point that I want to speak on this morning is the next bit of the story. Because at some point here between this happening... God speaks to Jacob and he says to Jacob, you need to now reconcile with your brother. And there was every reason under the sun why Jacob didn't want to reconcile with his brother. And Jacob gave him to God and said, God, um, he hates me. God's like, yeah, I get that. Now, God, he wants to kill me. Um, yep, yeah, that's, that's been part of the, the journey that you've walked in. I stole from him. Yeah, yeah, you did. But here's God, he's not allowing any excuse to replace what he wants to restore. And he says to Jacob, I want you to go and reconcile with your brother. Now here's the beauty of what Jacob does. He listens to God and he does it. It sounds ridiculous. It sounds stupid. It sounds like it's going to be dangerous. But at the same time, there's every fear under the sun that prevent him from getting in and doing this sort of stuff. But here is Jacob and he says yes to God. And so he starts off this journey with, uh, with Leah, with Rachel. He even had slave wives. It's a different culture, right? And so he, he had all of these animals, all of these cows, all of these camels, all, of, all these kinds of things. And he's taking them on this journey. Uh, to meet Esau. Now, on the journey, he gets word that Esau knows he's coming. And his servant comes back to him and says, Jacob, Esau's got 400 armed men. Everything about that moment that Jacob freezes him in his boots because he knows that 400 armed men is an army. And what is Esau doing with an army? Coming towards Jacob, who was just trying to be faithful to what God had said to him. And here's Jacob. So this is what he does. He sends gifts, firstly, to Esau. Next, he sends out his slave wives with their, with their children, with his children. Then he sends out Leah with her children. And then he sends out Rachel with her children. And then he sits down for the night. That particular night, the Bible says, a man came and wrestled with Jacob all night. Hidden lessons from the past. Let's listen to this. The man, as we know in the story, way back at the book of Genesis, is God. God 
in the flesh. Who is that? Are we willing to say that out loud, right? Jesus, right? Jesus. There are times in the Old Testament where scholars believe, and I do as well, that Jesus turned up. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, where a man of God turns up. God in the flesh wrestles with Jacob all night. Now, I don't know if you've ever wrestled with anyone for 10 minutes. It's a lot of hard work. Anyone wrestle for 10 minutes? Never wrestle for 10 minutes, right? I've got two brothers. I've wrestled for 10 minutes. And by the end of 10 minutes, you're all sweaty, and you're tired, and you're just going, please. Come on. Uh, when my boys get old, got old enough, I wrestled with them too until they started hurting me. Stop wrestling at that point in time. Uh, but the concept of wrestling with somebody the whole night and not giving up on that wrestle is you're actually wanting something from that. This is not just fun. Something is happening in this moment where Jacob is wrestling with God. Or if you want to say it, is wrestling with Christ. And there, for the whole night, they are wrestling until finally the Bible says this. When the man, as in being God, realised that he would not win. Think about that for a moment. That little theological conundrum. When God realised that he would not win. When does that ever happen? When God realized that he would not win. I want you to hear this. This is, this is relationship and this is God, right? When God turns up in your life, it is never to destroy you. It's always to redeem and restore you. He is not here to win and have a victory over you. He is here to redeem and restore you. And Jacob himself was in this place where he's wrestling with somebody that in some part of that night he realises this is God. We don't know when that happened, but we realise between then and between the end of this wrestle, he's all of a sudden realised this guy carries something that cannot be steal, stolen and cannot be wrestled from. It has to be given. The man who is God says to Jacob, you've got to let me go. And Jacob says to him, I will not let you go until you bless me. I will not let you go until you bless me. And here's what one thing God said to me, he doesn't mind being wrestled with. I often wrestle with my circumstances and not with God. I don't know if you guys do the same, but I often find, like, when I'm standing at the bottom of a ski field and I've had a fall or I've gone down the wrong way, I'm wrestling with my circumstances, I'm not wrestling with Him. But what I'm actually doing is wrestling with my fears until I actually work through these places of understanding that the fear is holding me back and I'm actually going to step into places where I've never been before and that's where I'm going to discover not only that I can ski, sort of, I'm no professional, please don't ever think that I am. I would just get down from one top of the mountain to the bottom. But when I do it with God, I find something that I'm not going to give up. So here, here is Jacob and says, I'm not going to let go of you until you bless me. And the whole concept of the blessing, now so that's a big phrase that we use today and it covers a whole multitude of things, but the concept of asking someone for a blessing is asking them for something that you don't have. They carry something that can add value into your life. And so if you want a blessing from somebody else, you're looking for what they carry to be passed into your life. And so when we hear a worship team that pours something into our lives, what they're doing is blessing us because they carry something that they are giving into us. It's such a privilege. Such a privilege. Well, here's, a, here's Jacob and he says, I am not letting go of you until you give to me this blessing. Here's the blessing. Are you ready for it? So here's a man who's been known as a supplanter or a deceiver his entire life. That's how he's known. The Bible says, the man says to him, your name is no longer Jacob, it is now Israel. Does anyone know what the word Israel means? 
The word Israel means God fights. God fights. So here's a guy who was known as a supplanter, a stealer of birthrights, to now he's known that God fights for him. God walks with him. Now here's a little trivial thing that you might think is trivial, but it impacted me in a pretty large way when I read it. So Jacob has a name change. The translators continue to use the word Jacob instead of the word Israel. So they call him what God does not call him. Even in the Hebrew where it says Israel, they still change it to say the word Jacob. That this is Jacob, this is not Israel, this is Jacob. And so again we even have our translators that are trying to say, he is known by what he did, he is not known by how God sees him. That's our translators that are doing that. When God changes your name, He is releasing you from the burden of your past. He has given to you a new name. He has blessed Jacob with a new name. If you know the story of Jacob, God had to do this twice to him. Because sometimes when God says something, it takes a while for it to sink into us. Am I really forgiven? Am I really loved? Am I, am I really free? And it seems like God doesn't mind repeating himself. But here is God saying to Jacob, your name is no longer Jacob. I don't actually know you as Jacob anymore, so don't refer to me. Don't refer to yourself as Jacob anymore. I know you as Israel. I have fought, I have wrestled, and I have given. I've given you a new name. His name would become the name of all of Israel, the whole nation. It would become all that God had promised him. But he asked Jacob to hold on to this new name. Can you imagine what that was like for Jacob as he came and saw his family and said, Jacob, because it's actually not Jacob anymore, it's, it's Israel. And how did that happen? Well, let me tell you how that happened. Imagine when he saw his brother Esau, it's Jacob. And I said, it's not actually, God changed my name. Esau, in the story of Esau, is they did reconcile. It's a beautiful end of the story. The 400 men didn't wipe them out or anything like that. He reconciled. But again, when they use the names of the past, all they're doing is drawing your, your actions or behaviours from the past. When they speak to you as to who you are today, they're using the lens of how God sees you. And, and so when, the, when God speaks to you, when he speaks into Lorraine or he speaks into Rochelle or he speaks into Pam, he's using the name that he knows you by, not by the actions of your past. Are you with me on that? Yeah. It doesn't mean that your lens is defunct or because often we look at ourselves through our own lens, but God has his own lens. And his lens on your life and the lens on Lorraine's life is he is in love with you. He is head over heels about you. He is so in love with you that he could not care less what you've done before. He is just so in love with you that he's so impacted by your presence that that's what he wants to do every day. He wants to show up. He wants to turn up. He wants you to be in that place where when you're seeing your heart out like this, you are willing to allow the Spirit of the Lord into that place. Jacob, in all the time, and look, why I love Jacob's story, hidden lessons of the past, is that Jacob, God spoke to Jacob in dreams time and time and time and time and time again. He was a dreamer. It was before Joseph came around. Jacob was a dreamer. And God spoke to him in dreams. And it spoke to him so much that, that he would build altars about it. He would change the course and direction of his life because of it. And he would move where God had called him to move. And he would wait for God to come in and speak in, 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 and talk into his life. And the whole concept of the conversation that God brought into Jacob's life was about his restoration, his redemption, his transformation. But that was his life. Hidden lessons from the past. Why I bring that up today is that each of you have got hidden lessons from the past. It doesn't matter if you've been on the planet for 18 years like Anna has or 49 years like I have, there are hidden lessons from the past. There's things in your life that God is still speaking to you in and through. And there's things in the past that our fears will continue to speak in and through as well. Uh, and the question I want to ask you this morning is whose voice are you listening to? 
Uh, because again, in this concept with Jacob, he had to listen for the voice of the one that he wrestled with. And that voice of the one that he wrestled with is the one who gave to him the new name. And we speak about grace, and we've been speaking about grace for the last however many months. But the whole concept that through grace, Christ has come into our lives and he's given us a new name and a new identity. And we are now known as his. We are now known by his love. We are now known by His grace. We are now known by His love, His hope. We are now known by the faith that we have for Him. And if we are known for anything else other than what God has given to us, then we are listening to the wrong thing. When we hear stories of Sulawesi or, or, or uh, Nauru or anything to do, we, we go, what could God do to impact that? And our faith starts shrinking as soon as we start hearing of a big story. But I just believe that we are in a time and a season where as we start seeing who God has called us to be, that if we are known as, as, as Israel or as God fights or however it is that God knows you, if we start living out the identity that God has given to us, then before you know it, other people are going to be receiving the gift that God has given to us. And that gift is not to destroy, that gift is to redeem. And it is to restore. It is to restore. He is not here to defeat you. He is here to liberate you. To teach you hidden lessons from the past. Stories we have heard and known, stories our ancestors have handed down to us. We will not hide those truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord. Every single one of you have got glorious deeds inside of your lives. Every single one of you. The day that you accepted Christ is a glorious deed moment because your life became eternal in the concept of the kingdom of God and coming into the kingdom of God. Today is another moment for us to open our ears to hear what the Father has said to us. Let's pray together. I wonder if you'd like to stand with me and pray. Father, that there's all of us in this room can think through our, our lives and go, what have we been known for? And yet that can be a, a sordid or a difficult journey. But this morning, Lord, our desire is to receive the blessing of the Father's voice into our lives. That we can know and hear the way that you see us. I am not known as fearful. Christ sees me as faithful. I'm not known as hopeless. I, I'm known as hopeful because the way that the Father sees and the Father gives. And so, Lord, this morning in this room, I just want to pray that those who are carrying burdens of the past, that today will be a day where we just allow those things to fall. And we choose to believe a lens that you are seeing us through. That you are so in love with us. That you are so invested in us. That you are so in relationship with us. Nothing will change that. Allow us, Lord, this morning, as we open our ears, and Lord, I pray that today, that even as we're opening our ears, our hearts will be just opening whatever song we're about to sing and however we're about to finish this service, Lord, it'll be a time where, Father, our hearts can be bound together as one. But we can hear your voice as one. I pray that in Jesus' name. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time this morning and we thank you for your love for us. And Lord, we pray as we go downstairs, Lord, that you'll bless the food that we're about to eat and the conversations we're about to have around this table. Jesus, draw up a seat. You are welcome. You are so welcome. So Lord, we say thank you for this time this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. And I'm in. Come on downstairs. Let's have some food.